Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thanks, Munir, for the nice introduction. And let me start by thanking all the attendees for their interest to be part of this uh, 6G summit focusing on connecting the unconnected uh, in order to hear from different experts from both academia and industry about their thoughts on beyond 5G uh, or 6G mobile networks. Uh, actually, some of you may be surprised that uh, we are already talking about 6G while we are still, uh, in a way, at the very early stage of 5G deployment and, and just in few cities worldwide. But I hope that uh, you'll be convinced by uh, the end of uh, today's summit that we need indeed to start shaping 6G, uh, which is expected uh, to be deployed, uh, as you know, around 2030. So let us start uh, by talking about the so-called mobile revolution. Indeed, uh, some argue that uh, mobile is the most rapidly adopted consumer technology in history. Uh, this is, uh, in one way, the result uh, of uh, uh, the merger of the internet, uh, electronics, uh, wireless communication and networking. Uh, today, we can use our mobile phones uh, or, or tablets to make phone and video calls, order things online, uh, check time and location quite accurately, access all sorts of entertainment like listening to music, watching a movie, and uh, as you know, many more things. So it's kind of uh, uh, mind boggling that uh, what was uh, regarded uh, as uh, what I would say uh, independent services, uh, independent function, uh, even uh, kind of different tools or devices just a few years ago have been uh, integrated over the last uh, decades uh, or so in this kind of uh, single mobile uh, smartphone. Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, as users, we still want more, more coverage and more connectivity, higher data rates, uh, better access anytime and anywhere. And all of this in a cheaper or, or let us say uh, in a more uh, affordable uh, fashion. So, I mean, these increasing demand are somehow uh, things that we have seen over and over again during the past four decades. So 1G was in a way the proof of concept stage and uh, it brought us in the uh, 80s, uh, the first mobile phones. Uh, during the 90s, uh, 2G made us move from analog communication to uh, better quality uh, digital communication with both voice and texting exchange capabilities. Then came the 3G era in the 2000s, and with it we moved uh, online and started browsing uh, the internet from our mobiles. And we are now uh, enjoying uh, the high speed provided by our 4G smartphones, a speed that is expected to go to even higher values and to connect uh, a higher number of devices and machines uh, with the early deployment of 5G this year, essentially as we speak. So as you can notice from the slide in front of you, it takes about 10 years to design, develop, uh, validate a generation of mobile communication system, and it takes another 10 years to, to deploy it, expand its usage until it becomes mature and it gets eventually retired so that the following generation gets adopted. So you can easily guess that as we start deploying 5G, we, and, and here I mean uh, researchers in communication and network engineering, have started already brainstorming and planning for what should 5G B. Uh, so, in a way, it's a speculative period of time, and uh, there has been more than a dozen perspective, uh, vision, paper, white papers, if you will, uh, as well as workshops, symposia, and all kinds of summits over the last uh, 18 months or so, uh, giving their vision on how uh, beyond 5G or 6G network should push the envelope and target higher speeds uh, uh, a more user capacity, let's say lower latency for a variety of emerging and future applications, some of them displayed in the slide in front of you. In other words, uh, there is already quite a bit of brainstorming and this is happening worldwide. And this brainstorming 
is happening uh, about 6G, uh, uh, superior quality of service and the hyper connected environment uh, it is supposed to bring by 2030. Now, before getting into this, it's probably important to look uh, at the map in front of you uh, showing uh, the current worldwide 4G distribution. And this map clearly shows that we are suffering from serious gaps in global internet connectivity. We tend indeed to forget that we still have about half of the world population, a number some, somewhere between three to four billion people without broadband internet uh, connection. And it's expected that 5G, uh, or at least in its current initial deployment stages, we further, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, accentuate this connectivity divide. Uh, actually, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic showed also that the connectivity divide can be sometimes a matter of life and death for people who are unable uh, to access essential healthcare information and services and in a way is becoming one of the modern faces of inequality, uh, deepening the economic and social imbalances between the haves and, and have not. That, in our view, 6G should be also about connecting the unconnected. And uh, uh, there is a need for more intense research efforts to narrow this connected divide in order to offer these often economically and socially isolated three to four billion people who are unconnected or underconnected, uh, the possibility to experience the transformative benefits that come with connectivity from access to better health and education, to smart far farming, new um, uh, economical opportunities and new jobs, and uh, also real-time uh, financial uh, services. So in this context, uh, uh, we should refer to the Sustainability Development Goals, or in short, the SDGs, which include noble targets related to reducing inequalities between people, improving the health of people, providing quality education, eliminating poverty, among many other noble goals. Uh, they have been adopted a few years ago by the United Nations, and they are supposed to be somehow achieved by 2030, which is incidentally the year when we expect the initial uh, deployment of 6G. So there is here kind of an interesting timing between the deployment of 6G and the timing uh, when uh, uh, the United Nations SDG are uh, expected to be achieved. As such, uh, and in this context, uh, let's say that contrary to previous generation of mobile networks, which were essentially uh, and primarily driven by financial and profit consideration, it is expected uh, that the SDGs will drive, or at least partially drive, the evolution of 6G. Uh, so, what does it mean? It means that beyond trying to achieve uh, this superior performance improvement uh, mentioned earlier, one of the important 6G goals should be about bringing global connectivity and contributing to the development of tomorrow digitally inclusive world. This means that 6G research efforts should focus also on connecting rural areas, remote regions, and low-income slums, and should aim to reduce the inequalities between the haves and have-nots. So as a wrap up and looking at this well-known 5G radar chart, we can say that uh, the 6G radar, or, or if you will, the spider chart of 6G, will probably involve the same classical 5G user scenarios, EMBB, URLLC, and MMTC, but with tighter performance expectation, or let us say requirement, in addition, we may see uh, emerging or future application, like for example, in the AR, VR, gaming domain, requiring the combination of the expectation or requirement of, of more than a single user scenario, like EMBB and URLC, in the case, uh, for instance, of AR, VR, gaming, I just mentioned uh, uh, before. So, in addition to that, 6G should embody the so-called global access to the Internet for all, or in short, the Gaia objective. Or in other words, the fact that Internet access must be considered 
as a basic human right. This can be done by adding an extra user scenario dedicated to, let's say, a light version of the internet access, which uh, in the context of a superior 6G standard connection will be uh, all enjoying, let's say, uh, by 2030. By that time, uh, there should be at least and always a 4G-like connection over a wide coverage area, and which would be suitable um, for basic online activities like email, web surfing, uh, and audio video streaming uh, at an acceptable quality for every person everywhere uh, uh, on earth. So in this way, providing connectivity to the unconnected should not only be seen as a humanitarian goal, but also as an opportunity to generate crucial economic activity. So a small step towards connectivity at the base of the world uh, uh, economic uh, pyramid. Uh, and th this term uh, is not my own invention. It was introduced uh, by the two economics, Prahald and Huart, cited in this slide uh, in front of you, to refer to the poorest socio-economic group uh, in the globe. So uh, uh, these small steps uh, toward uh, connectivity at the pace of the world economic pyramid, which actually tend to be uh, the people who are unconnected or underconnected, uh, this can actually uh, create a huge market of creative and resilient uh, consumer and producer who are currently excluded from a current uh, formal market. Indeed, narrowing this connectivity uh, divide will eventually reduce the economic and social imbalances between the have and have not in this digital context and open this new huge market. Uh, and uh, in a way, this explains um, why there is uh, this strong interest and involvement uh, by the GAFA of the world. I mean, here the Google, Amazon, Apple, and Facebook, uh, who uh, are dedicating some effort in uh, this global connectivity theme. Uh, and you will hear today from some of the top researchers working uh, in the connectivity research lab of these big tech companies. Looking again at a uh, relatively uh, recently provided global connectivity map provided by the ITU, uh, it's clear that uh, many developing countries are still experiencing uh, uh, a critical digital darkness. Uh, this uh, connectivity divide affects uh, also uh, rural and uh, remote areas within developed uh, countries. And, and the reasons are many beyond the basic social issues such as literacy, including digital literacy and, you know, basically uh, accessing and uh, using uh, computers, uh, language, uh, lack of, uh, you know, relevant local content uh, and services, as well as, unfortunately, sometimes just outdated policies and regulations. So on the top of that, I would say that uh, the main reasons are economic reasons, uh, you know, we are having more and more expensive smartphone, uh, expensive, I would say, even uh, uh, confusing uh, data plans. And this well-known uh, return on investment model used by mobile network operators that have to pay the spectrum uh, quite expensive, uh, uh, you know, uh, amount of monies. Uh, and at the end of the day, it does not make uh, much business sense for them to deploy uh, their equipment in sparsely populated area, they tend to go after uh, urban, highly dense uh, environments. Uh, there is, of course, uh, um, the fact that uh, sometimes it's difficult to access, uh, uh, you know, some terrains like mountains, uh, small islands, uh, in which it is uh, uh, not easy to, to install and uh, maintain uh, a terrestrial uh, uh, telecom infrastructure. And another important reason is that uh, we tend to forget that uh, to have uh, an app uh, and uh, running uh, a telecom network, uh, we need to have uh, an underlying uh, uh, power grid. Uh, and in many of these uh, developing countries, uh, the power grid uh, is uh, uh, either not existent or if it's there, it's not that uh, reliable. So uh, these are some of the reasons that we were having these bad uh, statistics. Now, uh, 
I would like to emphasize that this uh, connectivity divide does not affect only developing countries uh, in, uh, 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 you know, or, or let's say rural, remote uh, areas of developed country. It can also touch uh, the heart uh, of some of the major cities uh, worldwide. And here I mean low-income neighborhood like the, the slums, the flavela of the world. Uh, or, for example, uh, or like uh, uh, temporary refugee camps. So, so uh, you know, just uh, the bottom line of it is that th the main reason behind this digital divide is in many instances due to, one, uh, the low expected revenue per area in rural environment in contrast to the more uh, uh, revenue, let's say 1,000 more revenue per kilometer square in densely populated urban environment, and number two, uh, the low expected revenue uh, calculated uh, as average revenue per user, you know, the well-known ARPU in low income neighborhood or uh, temporary community uh, like refugee camps. And, and of course, both of these reasons uh, reduce, uh, uh, you know, telecom companies, MNO uh, appetite or willingness to invest and operate uh, uh, connectivity networks in these somehow uh, unattractive uh, areas. So, as I mentioned earlier, and since uh, the internet is uh, becoming uh, essential to all uh, our communities, there is this hope, uh, this goal, that as part of uh, our 6G efforts, and with the bonding cooperation of hundreds of partners, including uh, internet service providers, network operators, uh, developers, uh, local entrepreneurs, uh, non-profit organizations, uh, researchers like ourselves in academia and industry, uh, government subsidies for long-term investment uh, and return, uh, and, and actually the big tech companies, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, all of these actually can eventually uh, uh, benefit themselves from this uh, economical theory of the base of the pyramid, uh, and uh, we can hopefully explore new ways of uh, bringing uh, fast, uh, reliable internet to, to those without it uh, today. And uh, this is really the purpose and objective of this uh, inaugural 6G summit on connecting the unconnected. Uh, so basically, by providing uh, this high quality connectivity, we can essentially break this uh, vicious uh, digital divide uh, 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 kind of uh, cycle uh, illustrated in the diagram in front of you and uh, enable uh, richer, uh, denser communities to share knowledge and uh, strengthen the economies of less fortunate uh, and more uh, sparsely populated uh, uh, communities. So this way, and once we truly achieve global connectivity, and once we can take advantage of the expected technological advances in the IoT domain, we can basically move out of this so-called, uh, or let's say this narrow, let's say, smart city concept to the broader concept of smart villages, smart towns, smart suburbs, in short, smart living. One can enjoy quality healthcare, quality education, and actually several jobs can tolerate employees working remotely with all the progress in communication technology as we have experienced over the last uh, few months with the COVID-19 situation. So all of this can take place in less crowded, less polluted, not densely populated environment and this quality living can be enjoyed without having to move to a big city. Uh, and this way, hopefully, this can trigger the first global counter urbanization uh, over the past thousand uh, years. Looking uh, at the diagram displayed in front of you, uh, uh, illustrating the dependence of the quality of experience versus cost per user in low dense population area, can explain a little bit why it took us so long to kind of start to kind of trying to solve this problem. So when you look at this diagram, you can see that traditional geostationary satellite communication systems, which are of course great for TV broadcasting, actually offer limited bandwidth and suffer from a high latency as far as internet browsing is concerned. So they cannot uh, deliver, let's say, uh, uh, fiber quality uh, uh, broadband uh, internet, uh, which is our target. So the same diagram here illustrates that 
full deployment of fiber cables or microwave wireless link is just not economically feasible for remote or rural area, which are typically characterized by a low density of population. So our goal is to, to, uh, to go after what we can call the global connectivity holy grail on the top left of the diagram displayed in front of you. And I mean by that we are going for the best of both worlds and target a terrestrial fiber quality, but with a global satellite coverage, hopefully fulfilling this interesting prophetic prediction made 100 years ago by Nikola Tesla and that you can read in the slide displayed in front of you. So, so the question is, how, how can we do that? So global coverage without relying on the deployment of costly infrastructure on the ground will depend on the deployment of three dimensional integrated network that encompass terrestrial, airborne and satellite communication. As such, a flying network platform such as uh, UAVs, drones, uh, tether aerostat or blimps and high altitude platforms could become ever present uh, by the 2030s. Now, in this context, we will get in this summit uh, several interesting presentations on novel wireless communication schemes that integrate satellite, airborne, and terrestrial network, and that are aiming to support land, maritime, and flying user and devices. More specifically, we are talking here about self-organized network that rely on uh, terrestrial base station, drones, balloon, HAPs, and uh, non-geostationary satellites. Uh, all of these are adapting their structure and their resource allocation based on the ground population density and the quality of service required by the apps utilized by these population of users. So going back to our 6G summit program, we'll have this afternoon two reach session on this topic. First, a session on backhaul solution presenting different families of very high throughput geo satellite or mega constellation of non-geostationary non satellite solution. And two, another uh, uh, section uh, dedicated to access issues, talking about uh, tether uh, aerostat uh, or helikite, as well as HAP, HAPS, as natural evolution of the more classical high tower maths solution that we are employing uh, today. So before concluding, I would like to highlight the interesting connection that exists between what will be presented today in terms of innovative telecom and networking solution to connect the unconnected and the more general emerging concept of network in a box, known also as pop-up network, which basically offer a set of portable and self-organizing nodes that provide seamless connectivity to uh, a group of mobile users in different other contexts, such as, for example, emergency communications, uh, you know, facing uh, a situation where we deal with natural catastrophes or man-made uh, uh, kind of uh, situations uh, where uh, basically the terrestrial infrastructure uh, uh, is, uh, is destroyed. Uh, it can be helpful for offloading. Uh, you have a concert, you have Olympic Games, and you need like extra capacity for a few days or a couple of weeks. Uh, you are sending uh, uh, researchers or uh, uh, kind of um, uh, you are like people are going for scientific missions in the middle of the Amazon or desert. Uh, you, you know you can rely on this network in the box. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, the military missions that can also benefit from uh, this technology. Uh, I would also like to mention that uh, I have been focusing here uh, in this opening presentation on motivating what we should develop uh, for tomorrow, uh, uh, more inclusive uh, world in terms of connecting the next three to four billion and connect or interconnected people. But beyond that, actually bringing global connectivity can also activate the use of various internet of X things technologies, including Internet of underground things, Internet of uh, underwater things, Internet of space things. And this context, uh, research now suggests that using these Internet of X things technologies in a fully connected world will help with another United Nations uh, uh, 
SDGs, uh, for example, with smart farming application, which can improve the cost uh, efficiency and safety of food production. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, also in monitoring global, global climate change, which, uh, as you know, uh, is a big challenge which requires great attention from the scientific uh, community because, you know, climate change is significantly affecting uh, the life on, 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 on in our globe. As a second concluding remark, I would like to make a final connection between aerial and space telecom network solution that will be presented this afternoon for global connectivity purposes and the new interesting emerging and future trends in transportation system. Indeed, uh, since the development of uh, transport system, uh, human have exploited the ground level, uh, basically, uh, let's say, you know, cars and train and trucks uh, below ground, like subway and metro uh, and high altitude space. Uh, like um, airplanes, uh, you know, uh, for transportation purposes. However, with the increasing burden uh, of expanding population and uh, rapid uh, uh, urbanization in recent decades, uh, public uh, transportation systems and freight traffic are suffering huge pressure. Uh, as such, transportation engineers and researchers uh, have started to explore the end use so-called near ground space ngs for transportation uh, purposes and here i mean uh, kind of using the so-called autonomous flying cars or uh, flying taxi which are not uh, totally a novel uh, idea uh, it was predicted by henry ford uh, early on uh, so uh, uh, these flying cars or taxi will be moving around uh, and they'll be moving around not uh, not only moving people but also goods and as such they will aim at uh, not only solving the traffic con traffic congestion problem and uh, releasing the strain of uh, uh, you know or like the kind of pressure on existing city transport network in densely populated urban area but also uh, uh, they will aim to solve the so-called last mile transportation problem by making access to remote rural and uh, hard to get uh, areas uh, in a more convenient or uh, cheaper fashion and this in this context obviously aerial and space network will help keep these flying cars and taxi connected for control and command purposes and of course to offer good connectivity to the passenger during their trip in these flying uh, taxis or cars. So uh, in conclusion, I would like to thank you again for your interest and for your attention. And I should also of course thank all the speakers who agreed to be part of today's REACH program. Uh, to demonstrate in a way that as telecom engineers we have no choice but to to uh, let's say keep uh, pushing uh, in order to achieve uh, this dream of uh, global connectivity fulfilling hopefully uh, by 2030 uh, at a time uh, we will be deploying our first version of 6g network this other uh, interesting prediction made 100 years ago by nikola tesla and that is displayed in front of you uh, let me now give the floor to Dr. Bilal Jamusi of the ITU, who will be introduced by Munir. And uh, as the final speaker of this uh, opening session uh, of uh, our first 6G summit on Connected and Connected, he will give the ITU perspective on this important issue. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of the program.